Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to touch bases with last week because it was really bothering me was remember I talked about um, when we're actually this. So this is in. You guys can see this, right? Good enough. Um, when we're working in the color editor in the advanced tab, you remember I said to you you could actually sample a color here, and if you sampled a color and you clicked on this, so actually this is I think the one we picked. And you remember it sort of gives you an illustration of the area that it's going to, the area of the color that it thinks you want to actually work with. Let me move my color editor up to the top so you can see the whole thing. And you remember we also talked about that there is this check mark right down here where you can say view selected color range. And if you turn that on, it eliminate, it turns everything in black and white that is not selected. And so you can see that it's primarily these reds and yellows are what being, are being selected here. But you also remember I said to you that you can actually do color in additive levels. So when we talked about this, you okay over there? Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Um, that the degree of adjustment that you can use in every single one of these uh, possible, la uh, these aren't layers, but these possible adjustments is only a shift of 30 degrees. So you can see, for instance, if we take this hue and I click on it and I drag it, it starts to push this more towards, in this case, it's pushing it more towards the yellows and the greens. That's why it's picking up a lot of green content here. But I also said to you that you could actually click on this and you could actually select the color again and you could move it again and you could send it another 30 degrees in that direction. So I'm going to do that again. However, when I look at these two things, when I turn one on and one off, it's not doing any sort of like cumulative effect here. It's not, it's not continuing to push it in 30 degree increments. And I was like, I don't know why that's happening because this is certainly didn't happen in version 10 of this software. And so I was playing around with it and it turns out this is the culprit right here. If you leave on this view selected color range, it perverts everything that goes on in here. It not only perverts it here, but it perverts it in layers as well. So if we turn this off, you can now see that the first adjustment here actually pushed it in a 30 degree a hue change. If you click on the second one, it's continuing now to push it. And so the effect will now be cumulative. So again, if I click on this guy again, I'll select these guys again push it again another 30 degrees again and you can see it'll continue to be cumulative but if you leave this view selected color range on you notice just the minute I turned that on all it what it ends up doing it ends up ignoring all the first two adjustments in this does that make sense what's going on and it's for me that's a bug for me that that, that should not be how it goes because at least when you do a single adjustment here with this turned on it previews it exactly the way it should so it's sort of like it works with only one of these layers on, but not with multiple ones on, which is, makes it essentially not work. Um, if I reset this entire, um, uh, um, this guy in its entirety again, you'll see that the very same thing happens up when you actually do this in layers. So I'm going to drag layers up to the top here. Uh, and in layers, we are going to create a new layer. I'm going to go ahead and create a filled layer so that it impacts this entire um, thing that we're actually looking at. And I'm also going to look at the color editor. So I've added an adjustment layer right here. I'm going to go into color editor. Uh, and again, I'm going to do the same trick. I'm going to go ahead and leave view selected color ranges on. I'm going to click on this guy and I'm going to do, uh, I'll do two different changes here. The first one I'm going to click on will actually do a hue change on that. So we're sort of changing it to the green yellows. Um, and then I'm going to do a second layer. And the second layer that I do on this again, We'll go back into color editor again, and this time I'll do, um, uh, let's do a saturation move. Uh, 
And so now you can see, again, with this view selected color range enabled, if I look at my color up here, if I go back and forth between these two or turn them on and off, I don't, it doesn't change. Nothing, none of this stuff works. It doesn't work the way this is supposed to work. And that's, again, because this color editor, I don't, this has got to be a bug. This view selected color range is still enabled. So if you uncheck that, go back up into your layers now and start to turn these guys on and off. You'll see that it functions exactly the way it's supposed to do. So it's just something that you should know about if you, so here's the trick. The takeaway from all of this is that use that to actually refine your color range to the area that, to the really target that you really want and then turn that thing off because otherwise it's going to not show you what it's actually doing. Make sense? Okay. So that's the only real wrap-up that I had left in that. The next thing I'd like to talk about really quickly is backing up. So I know I've asked this question before, but how many people in this room uh, do not have a backup of the files that they love and cherish? So everybody's got at least one backup, right? Or either that or you're lying to me. In your mind, yes, I have a backup because you're going to go out and buy one tomorrow, right? How many people have two backups? So here's the trick, and we have, this is just something, a way that you should start thinking about how you work, but this is, I'm telling you, this is the way you're definitely going to want to work. If you're going into somebody's studio and they don't know what they're doing, the sort of the thing that you ultimately want to set up. So this would be the workflow right here. This illustration, along with all the um, suggested um, um, file delivery formats, all that kind of stuff, whatever, all of those, there are PDFs that are on our Canvas site, and I can't again strongly suggest enough to you guys to simply download all of that information so that you've got it with you so that even if it doesn't really become critical hypercritical to you right now today it will believe me in six months and you'll have that stuff available to you I don't do when you guys go into canvas site do you have access to the file area can you get just can you go into in, instead of having to go to every single module can you download the entire file setting do you know what i'm talking about try this i don't know if i i know i have access to it because I, I i teach but if you look at this we'll go to our website and and look at it so for me i have this setting over here called files and i can get to all of the pdfs all at once so i can simply download all of this material um in one fell swoop so uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. Otherwise, you guys have got to go in and cherry pick all that stuff. Um, if you can't do it and you want somebody shoot me an email, um, I will take all the PDFs from this class and compress it into a zip, and I will upload it into like a WeTransfer or a, I don't know if this um, uh, Canvas can handle that file size, but if it can, I'll just put it in an announcement and upload it there. So somebody shoot me that email, and I'll, I'll uh, because it's a huge pain in the ass for you guys to have to go through every single module and open every single module and then download every. Anyway, okay. Asked and answered. All right, so we got through that. We got through that. We got through that. So back to your backup strategy. So I'm going to throw this one out to you. This is the way I do mine. Um, and this would be something that I would strongly suggest you guys doing. Um, um, so anyway, um, basically what this is, is you've got a camera uh, um, uh, uh, that's shooting tethered. And again, I don't know anybody who doesn't simply work tethered anymore. It doesn't matter whether you're a landscape photographer. It's hard to do it as a wedding photographer, that I'll admit. Shooting weddings, that kind of stuff. What I would suggest if that was the case, if that's what you're getting into, in, 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 in as best you can have at least something that you could set up to do a quick color balance of whatever event that you're at or arena that you're at or that kind of stuff just to have something that sort of gives you some references get a couple color cards in there make sure that your meter is actually exposing correctly that it's reading the scene correctly that you don't have to do minor adjustments to bump up your EV or something like that just to sort of have a reference to check out and then you're just going to have to shoot the way you normally have to shoot. I mean, I get that part, right? But other than that, I know all the fashion shooters, the beauty shooters, the landscape shooters, the, uh, um, again, sports is really, really, really tough to do this way. Um, but at any rate, so if you are doing the wedding thing, that's fine, but sort of you're going to, we're going to need to have to think about a way of reworking this to some level. So what um, and I'll show you how other people will do it so we can actually look at it instead of just shooting completely tethered we'll look at doing more cards and then adjusting them 
However, this working folder that you've got right here is something that you would actually have on the hard drive inside your laptop or if you're doing a tower inside your tower. And the reason you want this to be your working folder is, is that that hard drive is the fastest of all hard drives that you've got. So even if you have an SSD that's an external hard drive, the external hard drive has got to go through a connection. So your SSD hard drive may be incredibly fast, but the minute you plug it into a USB 3 cable, its speed is cut like astronomically. You go from 800 megabytes per second to 80. It cuts it on the order of, it leaves you with like 10% of your speed. Um, it's not the drive, it's the cable. So that's why you actually want to always shoot to the hard drive that's actually in your computer because that cabling doesn't exist. It's connected directly to the circuit board of your computer. So it's extremely fast. Inside that working folder, you would have a raw, a raw file folder. And this is again, where this is it. when we're shooting in Capture One, this would be your session folder. This would be your capture folder in session one. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. While you're doing this, especially if you're in studio, you can actually have an external hard drive that is an automatically hour backup. How many people in this room use Time Machine? How many don't? How many have no idea what Time Machine is? Every time you format a hard drive on your computer, uh, on a Macintosh anyway, this little window comes up and says, do you want to use this as Time Machine? And everybody always says no. What Time Machine does, and you can actually configure it from here, if you come up to your Apple menu down to System Preferences, inside of System Preferences you can find Time Machine, and you can click on it right here, and this is where you can actually dedicate. You could say you plug in, you would want to do this with a blank hard drive, you don't want to do this with any sort of uh, hard drive that's got material on it that you care about, because it sets up a situation where it's automatically writing to this disk. So um, the advantage of it is that, that it is automated. The disadvantage to it is that you really need a, a hard drive that's dedicated to do nothing but this. But anyway, you can actually select the disk and you can say, this is what I want you to back up. This is what I want you to watch. And what ends up happening is, is that it will watch the hard drive of your computer and you can set it up to do, you can set it up to back up every hour, you can set it up to back every half hour, every 10 minutes, you can set the time interval that it backs up. Because what most people will do, and this is the thing that we're going to try to avoid, is there's a lot of people, you guys I'm sure do the same thing. If you're in the studio shooting for a day, do you back up during your day or do you wait till the end of the day and back up then? Everybody waits to the end of the day and backs up then, and there's a liability in that. If you have some catastrophic event happen to your hard drive, say like at the end of the day or the afternoon, the middle of your shoot or something like that, whatever, your morning's gone. So the advantage of having this is that it, it simply watches this folder, and it just, in every hour or however often you set it up, it just copies all the stuff over. It does a backup for you, um, and it timestamps it. So you can go back, when you go back in to try to recover, you can say, oh, this is what my computer looked like at 10 o'clock this morning. This is what it looked like at 11 o'clock this morning. This is what it looked like at 12 o'clock this morning. And it's this automatic thing. Now, this is not a backup that you ever really want to use. This is just a safety to get you through your day. Does that make sense? However, then at the end of the day, you do want to do an official back up the way typically most of you guys are backing up. Most of you guys are dragging and dropping. You plug in an external hard drive. You drag all your files from your the hard drive that's in your computer over to the external hard drive, and that becomes your backup, right? So there's right ways and wrong ways of doing that. We need to look at that part as well. We'll take part in that in just, in just a second. So this would be considered a manual online, uh, 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 I'm sorry, manual offline backup. You need two of these. And the reason that you need two of these, what could possibly go wrong with a hard drive? What do you need to worry about in terms of your hard drive life? Most people worry about hard drive failure. It's the number one thing that people worry about. And how many people in this room have ever had a hard drive fail? So for those of you who haven't raised your hands, it's only a matter of time. Hard drives, are, they are destined to fail. They simply, there is no way that you can, and I don't care what kind it is, mechanical, SSD, it doesn't matter. It will fail, and if you don't have a backup, you've lost all that. However, there are other things that we need to consider about this that you need to worry about. Viruses. 
So you do have a backup, but you've got a backup that's infected and you can't read it. That makes it no good as well. Malicious damage. You've got an irate roommate who decides they're going to really fuck with you and they get your, uh, your uh, backup and they erase you, the stuff on your computer and then they get your backup and they throw it in the river and you are doomed. Um, transfer corruption. This becomes a huge thing that we've got to actually worry about. When you do your backup, how many people in here do you check your backup? So you go in and open every single file that's on your backup. No, you don't. However, there can be transfer corruption. And so if you've corrupted, I mean, if you've done your transfer, you've done your backup, but the backup transfer process corrupted the file, and then you lose your primary, your backup is corrupted, so you don't have that anymore. How many people in this room worry about lightning and voltage spikes in their house? So you have a surge protector on your computer, right? That's a good thing. If you are only working on a laptop, the connection between your charger, your brick, and, your, and the battery part in your computer functions as a reasonably good surge protector because it will fry your brick before it fries your computer. But you have to worry about those things. Uh, so most people, if you have desktop stuff, have things called surge protectors. And they look just like a utility strip, but they have fuses in them. And if there is a voltage spike that goes through that, it blows the fuse instead of blowing up your, um, uh, your hard drive. Anybody who's got really expensive... Um, um, stereo equipment, uh, audio equipment, computer equipment, any of that kind of stuff. Everybody search protects us, all that stuff. You can get them really cheap at, at Home Depot or, or in, anywhere, online. You can get it. Anyway, um, theft happens all the time. If you've got your, com your laptop sitting in your, your bedroom at home and your, uh, uh, and your hard drive is sitting right next to it, your backup hard drive is sitting next to it, and somebody breaks in your house and steals them both, you've lost everything. Your house burns down. Also, having those two next to one another is a complete liability. So that's what this second manual hard drive is all about. It's an offline, it's an it's a out-of-geographic location backup. So what a lot of people will do for this sort of situation, not that I'm trying to convince you that you should have a safety deposit box, but most people I know who actually do this, this is how they work. They have a safety deposit box, and they keep one of their hard drives in the safety deposit box and one of them at home that they use to do their backup. And then once a week, they trade them. So that at most, what you lose is a week's worth of material. So if somebody comes in and steals all your shit, they don't get the one that's in the safety deposit box. And at worst, it will be a week's worth of whatever work you've done. If you're paranoid about your work, you can trade it more often. I know other people that do trade-off with friends. So you've got a good friend who is in the same boat that you are. And just every week, you just swap your hard drives. You know, you just trade one of them out. So that the hard drive that they have at most will be as old as when you last traded your hard drives. And so if you're doing it once a week then you you're cut your liability down to only losing one week's worth of stuff. And if you're not shooting every day, then that could actually be, that could really sort of like save you. So it's just something else to uh, think about as far as that part goes. So when to actually back up. Again, it becomes really difficult to be backing up constantly as you're shooting. So that's where this automatic backup comes into play. And then at the end of the day, you would actually always do a backup at the end of the day. You would never wait longer than that. Because too, too much shit can happen at night. So this would be your working sort of situation. However, this is not an archival situation. Because, and some of you guys are doing this right now. Some of you guys have the folder that you've got on your laptop has grown so large. It's holding so many files. You're running out of room on your hard drive. And that's also causing you a huge performance hit on your computer. So at some stage of the game, you have got to start offloading stuff that you're not really currently working with. Because you guys, most of you guys are at least seniors, if not, well, I know you're at least all juniors, if not all seniors, whatever. And I'm sure half of you've got files on there from your freshman year. And it's not that you don't want to have those files, but you don't need immediate access to those files. You're not working with that shit every day. You're not working with it right now. So that stuff that becomes sort of like old enough should actually be archived and then this would be the archive system right here again you would dump all you would offload all of that raw file uh, stuff that you don't want anymore this would go again this you would have a backup of that very similar to your online to your manual one that's located with your computer and then you would again have an off-site uh, version of that you would have another copy of that that was someplace else so that if something catastrophic happens to your house you don't need to worry about that part of it now in this case the 
this this is actually done by uh, um, this is suggested a uh, workflow that comes out of it's a best practice workflow they also suggest that you do write once media and the reason they suggest that you do write once media is that if anybody were to get a hold of your archive they could actually sabotage your arc they could erase it with write once media it's all the only thing they can do is steal it or you know I burn it or melt it or whatever the, the fact is nobody can go in here and change anything that is on write once media does that sort of make sense this seems overkill to me um, but that's just me then the last thing that is not a part of this that you could consider to be your archive and your uh, offset uh, uh, backup drive uh, archive could be uh, online you could consider doing online now online uh, the prices have become relatively uh, inexpensive so to speak, um, I think you can get, I, I have no idea. I don't do it because, um, cautionary tale, um, there was a guy, we've actually, if you were in my retouching class, we work with his, some of his raw files, a guy by the name of Seth Resnick, who's probably the largest, most prolific um, stock shooter in the country right now and has been for a long time. Um, and he stored all of his files uh, um, uh, online. And that was just so he didn't have to worry about it and he could get access to it wherever he wanted to. And his online service bureau called him up, not call him, they sent him an email on a Friday afternoon and said, we're going out of business, you have till Sunday morning to get all your shit off our servers. And he had like 16 terabytes worth of data on it and he couldn't get it downloaded in time. I mean, it just, it was not, it was physically impossible to do. And so he lost it. So... Again, if you do it, you play with the big boys, you do Google Drive or some extended Google Drive or uh, I know Microsoft now is trying to get into the really big server business. Amazon has been in it for a long time, whatever. Uh, I would pick one of the big players if I was going to do that kind of stuff. But then you, again, you've got the whole upload download. And I actually, not in my office here, but in the office in my house, I've got um, gigabyte internet. But even then, can you imagine uploading, you know, two terabytes of data? Anyway, all right, so are we good on this part? Are there questions about this part? So there is a way that you can think about actually doing this um, for the wedding shooters, and it would look more like this. I take that back. It wouldn't look more like that. So in this case, you would eliminate the camera part of this issue and your cards would actually go into this very same sort of situation. So for those people who are shooting weddings and doing that kind of stuff, do you guys um, use your cards repeatedly during an event or do you have a large enough collection that you simply use, that you don't have to erase a card during an event? Yeah, because that would be definitely the way to do it, right? So that your card itself becomes a backup. And then you copy it. So as long as you're not erasing cards during the event, you get home, you realize that something has gone wrong, you've at least got the card to originate it from. So that would function as one. But then again, you would go into this exact same sort of tree hierarchy of protection um, to actually um, uh, take care of that part. Just a quick note for all of those who are doing that. Uh, how do you format your cards? Okay, so here's the trick about formatting cards. It's something you should, again, best method of, uh, of doing it. Never, ever, ever format a card in anything but the camera you're going to use it in. Even the difference between camera models. Now, pretty much, if you have a Canon 5D Mark III and you format a card and put it in another Canon 5D Mark III, you'll be fine. But if you put it in a 5D Mark IV, you run the risk of corruption. So you would never do it. When do you format your card? Exactly. You format, you do not touch that card until you absolutely have to do it. So it's right as you are getting ready to do new captures to the card, you format it then. Because as long as you haven't formatted the card, 
if something has gone wrong, it's your information is still on that card and you can recover it. So I know people who actually will download and they'll actually use a program. They'll either do it in Capture One or they'll do it in Lightroom, whatever, to reformat their card. Well, that's wrong on two accounts. It's reformatting the card. It's losing data before you have to lose it. And it's also getting your computer to format the card and not your camera, which is uh, anybody's guess how well that will work out. All right, are we good on this part? Okay, so I said to you I was going to show you really quickly how to do this. Unfortunately, I would have you guys doing this uh, tonight, but um, they don't have the software that I need for you to do it um, here. So I'm going to show you how this software works. Uh, again, I'm not in the software selling business, but it's the piece of software that every single person uses to do this. Uh, how many people in this room have even heard of Chronosync? How many people are using Chronosync? Yeah, so two of you. Well, I'm going to change that. And I'm going to show you why. So I'm just going to do this really quick. Um, this I'm going to just do uh, two folders uh, just to make this fast. There's no point in trying to uh, back up an entire hard drive. Um, but so I'm going to show you what Chronosync is, how you would set it up, specifically the things that you need to look for for even the people who are using it um, to make sure that you understand that you're using it correctly. So I am going to just do week number 12. I'm just going to do a backup of my week number 12. I'm going to sync this week number 12. That's this is on my. Uh, this is our class. This is actually. Uh, uh, the best practices stuff that we're talking about right now. This is the Chronosync Quick Start Guide. Again, all of this information is on our website. So I've got an external hard drive that I'm actually going to just add a week to it right now so that I've got um, a matching folder. So I've got something that, I would, again, I can set up as a source and as a target. So I'm just going to call this week 12. And say, so, okay, so you can see the week 12 here has got nothing in it. The week 12 here has got a bunch of PDFs in it and a few images, and that's about it. Okay, so this is Chronosync. There are different versions of Chronosync. Um, I have the full-blown version of Chronosync. You can get, uh, and this is one of the best things about it, is that Chronosync is constantly being updated. As soon as you buy a license into Chronosync, you own the license for life. You never get charged for any of the updates. I've been updating this software for uh, 15 years now and they've never asked me for another penny. I think, don't quote me on this, but I think the original, the, I mean the current price for Chronosync right now is about 50 bucks. Um, they have an express version, I know, Hallie, that you're using. And do you know what the difference in the express and the full-blown is? Okay. Yeah, it's more pared down. So but you should check into it. Um, if you uh, want, somebody shoot me an email. I'll look into it uh, and just make sure that, um, that you're not getting something that wouldn't really help you. Um, so I'm going to actually download this uh, release part later. So the way this software actually works is it allows you to set up what they call synchronizing documents or tasks. And then what you can do is, so let's say for instance I had four hard drives and I wanted it to be backed up to four different hard drives. I could set up a single task for each one of those hard drives so I would have four different synchronizer tasks and then I can grab all four of those and put them into what they call a container and sim simply run the container and you can schedule these things, you can have them run in the middle of the night. They can actually connect to servers so you, if you had your, a Google Drive if that's how you were doing it this thing will actually log in to Google Drive. It'll put in all your login information for you. It will find the drive that you're supposed to be backing up to, and it will do the sync in the middle of the night for you. So in mine, you can see in some of mine, I actually have um, my home folder is synced, my pictures folder is synced, my toss folder is synced, my uh, data folder is synced. My, I've got a whole series of things that are each individual tasks, and then I put all of those into a single container, and when I run that, it backs up my entire computer. So, but I don't have to run that. I can run just an individual one. I just want to back up my pictures folder. So anyway, we're going to build a, a sync action just so that you can see what it's like. You can do it with their little setup system, but it's really easy to do it. And uh, this is where part of this becomes really important for you guys. So I'm going to create a new synchronizer task. 
It opens up this window. It says, well, you need to name this thing. So I'm going to name it week 12 because that's what it is. It's synchronizing my two week 12 folders. I'm going to say OK to that. And then it says, OK, what do you want to sync? And so it does it in this sort of like layout of this. And I typically do it based on the layout, the physical layout that I've got. So right now, my uh, target folder, the hard drive that I've connected to this is on the left-hand side for me. So that's the week 12 I'm going to select. So if you click on choose, it'll bring up a navigation window. I'm going to go to my external hard drive and I'm going to click on week number 12 and I'm going to say select. And it selects that folder right there. It tells me what it is. It gives me a bunch of information about it, blah, 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 blah. So that part's great. Then on my right side, which is my laptop, I'm going to click on that, and I'm also then going to navigate to week number 12. It was in uh, the class for us right here. It's week number 12 right here. I'm going to select that part. Then this thing in the middle is, what do you really want to do with this thing? So in the case of backing up, what I want to do is I want to back up the files that are here on the right side to the left. So you click on this drop down menu and we would go right to left and you can see it's the arrow is pointing it's going to drag all the files from this way. When I used to have my studio in New York I had a, a desktop in New York and I had a desktop in Chicago and I used a laptop to actually trade files between the two that's how I would migrate files back and forth. So my laptop always needed to sync in both directions you can actually do that here as well you can set this to synchronize bi-directionally, meaning if you change something on the hard drive or your laptop, either one, it will flag that and it'll say, oh, okay, we need to move the files on the, from the hard drive over to this, to your laptop, and the ones from your laptop over to your hard drive. It does it both. But in the case of a backup, you don't want that happening. You want it to be single directional. You want your backup to always reflect what was going on in, uh, uh, in your primary uh, hard drive in your laptop. Does this make sense? So at any rate, so far this seems all pretty straightforward. You can also say that you want to synchronize deletions, which means if you actually delete a file in your primary, that it'll delete it in your backup. I don't really suggest doing that because the truth of it is, your primary here on your laptop, you should be getting rid of files that are on there to keep your hard drive open so that it's available to continue to take on more files. But you don't want to be erasing those from your backup drive. So I would not suggest doing that part. But the thing that does become important about it is this, and this is the reason I'm showing you guys this piece of software, and it's the reason you should buy it. When you guys do a backup, you simply take a file or a folder or a hard drive, and you literally drag it from one to the other to do your copy. That's how you do it, right? So you would, again, do this. You would come into your finder, you would grab week 12 here, and you would drag it down to here to do week 12, and it would make a copy. And my question again to you was, do you know if the copy was valid? Do you know if there was an error that happened in that transmission, that something crept in to that actual copying process? And it looks like everything is fine, but everything is not fine. So that's why you want to use Chronosync to actually do this. In Chronosync, you can set this up. It's under options right here. If you click on options, you can talk about how you want file handling to actually happen and to go down. And you'll see by default it's set up to actually just do a basic version of this. And you can see under here that it's basically just saying, uh, it's telling you how it's checking for your copy part. But if you click on this drop down and you come down to basic with verification, this software program will check your copy and verify that your copy is indeed valid. And it does it in a really interesting way. Your files are gigantic and what it ends up doing is, it ends up doing, it, it counts the actual number of bits in your origin and it counts the number of bits in your target. And it does this, those numbers are so incredibly large if any error were to creep into that, those numbers would actually not match. So they do it relatively fast. The verification is extremely fast, but it's also really accurate. And if you do get errors, the errors that actually come up, you can say, how do you want to handle this? So you can actually set it up to send you emails that uh, error has actually occurred. You can have it just warning. A screen comes up and says you get this big screen warning that says there's a problem that uh, that 
that sync did not happen correctly. There's errors involved in this. It's incredibly important. Nobody would actually do any sort of backing up of any value at all and not do it not using a program like this. Questions about this? Okay. All right. So unfortunately today, we didn't have good weather. Again, I was trying to get outside again. So we're going to do our best to emulate as much of that as we can. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things because I want to talk about shooting outside. So I ask this question to everybody uh, I, every single time I run this course. Um, uh, how many of you guys feel really comfortable and confident in your control of available light? Go ahead, be proud. You can raise your hand up high. And so what, what does that really mean? How do you control your available light? Are, are we just talking about exposure here or are we talking about control? Both? So what do you use to control your light, your available light? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Right. Because you've been sort of like dealt that card. Yeah, sports is really, really, really challenging. It's like, you know, weddings are, I think, a little bit less so only in that if you're lucky, you have at least some time that you can grab the couple and say, let's go here, and you can do what you hope to do. You can move them into pretty light. You can be selective about the background. You can, you can bring some decisions to it, whereas sports people, it's just sort of like strap on that big fucking lens and hope for the best, right? Yeah, and hope you don't get taken out on the sideline. Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay, all right. Yeah, that. All right, uh, I'm not going to bother to save this. I'm going to close this up. So uh, we've actually gotten through that. So barring the sports uh, uh, issue um, that uh, we were just talking about, um, I am actually going to show you, and we're going to demonstrate and talk tonight about dealing with available light and thinking a lot about available light and uh, uh, hopefully... Uh, again, hopefully it will be a, at least a partial substitute for not being able to get outside. Um, I'm also willing, if you guys want, we should have a general conversation. We can figure this out. Um, but we, it doesn't look like there's going to be any good weather this week. So I don't know what's going to be happening on the weekend or next week, whatever. But if you guys, if we can collectively get together on another day, um, I would be happy to try to actually get this outside and demonstrate all of this outside because, again, it's a whole lot more effective when you're outdoors. But we'll see. We'll see how things go tonight, and then we can all collectively decide that. Make sense? How many people in this room have ever heard of Stan Malinowski? Say what? Sounds familiar? Stan Malinowski, that's his name right here. Stan Malinowski was, um, back in the 70s, he was a photographer primarily for Penthouse. And how many people in this room have ever heard of Alexander Lieberman? How many of you are fashion people? I'll say again, how many people in this room have heard of Alexander Lieberman? Who is he, Corey? I don't know how much Okay. He was the creative director at Vogue from the 50s until the 90s. And he, the reason we all know Vogue is because of him. Uh, and anyway, he had gone through the 60s at Vogue, and they had been primarily using British talent, people like David Bailey and people like that. And he said in the mid-70s, he goes, I want a distinctly American voice for American Vogue. I don't want to be doing you know, Avedon portraits in the studio. I don't want to be doing pen stuff, even though he continued to work with pen. But he wanted this distinct, of what he called a distinctively American voice. And he ended up picking Stan Malinowski. And Stan Malinowski shot Vogue through at least, the, there was probably a 10 year stretch, mid 70s to mid 80s is going to be my guess. Stan Malinowski has lived in Chicago his whole life. He still lives here. So the premier Vogue photographer from 1975 to 1985, possibly a little bit longer, whatever, lives five blocks from here and nobody in this room has ever heard his name. And I think that's criminal. So at any rate, every chance I get, I talk about Stan Malinowski. This PDF is also in our, um, 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 on our website. I am going to turn the lights off so that you can actually see this a little bit better. Um, you have to take into consideration the, let me turn the slides over.
So you need to take into consideration the period in which this was shot. So the fashion itself and the hair and makeup, even the models here, are going to be extremely dated. But the techniques are absolutely stunningly priceless. Stan was actually one of the best available light shooters I have ever seen. And one thing that we don't get in here, but I've actually seen in person, it, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Stan would do, again, for a lot of his penthouse work, a lot of it was shot indoors. And Stan would set up mirrors to shoot available light through houses. So he would set a mirror up in the bedroom where light was streaming in and he would angle the mirror so it shot the light out the hallway door. He would have another mirror in the hallway door that would shoot it down the hallway into the living room. He would have another mirror in the living room that would reshoot it to, to hit the fireplace. I've never seen anything like this ever in my life. And they would have to keep adjusting them because as the sun moved, you had to keep tweaking them, whatever. But it was just the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life, ever. But again, pretty brilliant. So at any rate, what we're looking at here um, is, this is the sort of the resulting picture of this. This is all done with available light. So this big thing right here, this is actually would be a very large scrim. However, most people refer to this as a butter. You guys can see this, right? It's big enough, right? Um, most people will refer to this as a butterfly or they refer to the size of it. We've got one here. It's actually mine that I donated to the studio. So you guys are more than welcome to use it. Most of the people don't even know that we have them here or have it here, whatever. Um, but a lot of people will refer to it as its actual size. So they'll say um, they'll call it a six by six. They'll call it an 8x8 eight eight or a 12x12. 12 12. They actually have these things that are uh, 20 feet by 20 feet. And when you fly these things, which is what you refer to and when you actually set them up, um, I have actually seen, I was flying a 12x12 12 12 once, and you know that light stand right there, that medium high roller light stand, the really heavy one? I, the wind actually bent that stand to the point that I couldn't close it. We, it, was, it trashed the stand. That's how much wind these things can catch. And the bigger they are, the more, I mean, they're like giant sails. So at any rate, um, but anyway, any so what's going on here is that there is um, light that's coming from the side. You can see the light that um, all these guys are being backlit. So the light is coming from the complete other side of the butterfly. So it's totally side lighting her. And then he simply got a hard card. Now this is a, um, actually uh, there's one over here. This is also one that I've donated to the studio. So, um, most of these are made by Matthews. This one isn't. This is actually made by Lowell. Um, but you can see it's actually got, uh, it's got a reflector surface on it. The silver surface has been textured. The texturing part softens up the lights. This is not like a mirror, so it doesn't hit you like a mirror. It kicks back. It's very efficient. It kicks back, but it's not quite like a mirror. But the advantage of this is that it's rigid, so you can really control light. So you can do things like... I'll show you something. When we get a lighting setup, I'll show you something better. But anyway, that's what he's using on the side right here to actually fill in the other side. And that's it. However, he has taken a really, really, look at how hard the light is on all of these people, and he's produced that incredibly soft shot that ends up running as a cover. The other thing about this one is that it opens up. There's a white side on the other side. It reflects only about 90% of the light. This reflects more like 99% of the light. But it's also got a hole in it that you can actually shoot through. And this is how a lot of people shoot beauty, because it's extremely flat. You can use these in the studio as well. You don't have to only use them here. So at any rate, that's what he's got going on there. Relatively simple setup as far as that part goes. But the scrim part of this becomes the real key to this. It makes it a really big light source. There's a, if you can imagine the amount of wrap that's actually coming. Look how he's got this thing set. He does not have her sitting here in the middle of this. He's got this thing pulled all the way forward because this leading edge right here is what provides his wrap for the other side of that face. It's the same thing as using an Ellen Chrome. Right? Remember when we were using Ellen Chrome, we were talking about wrap? He's got her pushed that far back because it just extends the wrap. That wrap is coming just that much more around the front of her face. Does that make sense? Uh, and then the fill card is actually producing, filling in the rest. So...
This is a great one. How many of you guys do tracking shots, running shots? Wedding people should be doing all of that stuff, right? The bride and the groom running away from the church with, you know, all happy and lucky and all that. How do you do that shit? Do you just run after them? Doesn't that become a real problem? Because you're bouncing, the camera's bouncing, that whole nine yards, right? So these are called dolly shots. This is, they actually make dollies that are designed to do this. But a wheelchair will work in a pinch. A uh, cart, like the um, yacht carts that we've got right here, will work in a pinch. I've even done this on a skateboard. You just sit down on the skateboard, you get somebody to push you on the skateboard, and you have total control, and they just push you as fast as the people are running. Simple, right? The best way to do tracking shots is in the back of a car. If you have a car that has a trunk, take a C-stand, put it inside the car, run the C-stand up so the car hood is, so that, you know, the trunk part is not banging your head the entire time you're like driving down the street to do this, whatever. And then you simply drive down the street and you either chase people or they chase you. If you're lucky enough to get on the beach, which you can do at Daytona, you can actually bring cars on the beach there and you can do tracking shots along the entire length of the entire beach. So you got people running in the surf and you're just driving along in the car, shooting pictures, yelling at them. But the idea of you not having to actually move yourself, of being moved, will change your tracking photography like you cannot believe. It makes it so much better. There's less bounce. Things are sharper. You can compose better because you're not thinking, oh, God, I'm trying to walk and I hope I don't trip over something and blah, blah, blah. You guys, yeah, anybody who's done this who's been there, yeah. So anyway, um, wheelchair. If you're at any hotel, they will have a wheelchair. Um, I love this one. This was actually shot in the rain. And this is all shot with film, by the way. Um, he's in Alaska, and he simply, he's got a tent that he puts her in. He's getting soaked, but the tents actually act as a sort of a light dome, as a diffuser. It's pretty much like shooting jewelry. He's got a little bitty fill card out to the side, and that's basically it. And look at what he's actually able to achieve. Um, if you're ever shooting out on the street, one of your best friends, I've shot so much fucking pictures, so many pictures in the pouring down rain in New York. If you're ever in New York and you actually have to shoot in the rain, you head to Tribeca. Everybody heads to Tribeca. Everybody. I have done more photo shoots standing next to more famous fashion photographers because we're all jammed under these awnings for the garage, for the truck entrances, for the garages in Tribeca. So Tribeca used to be a warehouse district. And they have these, um, uh, in order to be able to offload trucks, uh, during the rain, they have these gigantic awnings that shoot out over, they, they cover the street. And the streets in New York, you can actually shoot in the streets of New York, so whatever. So everybody huddles under these things, and every, people bring lighting under those things, whatever. So you still have your entire city background to shoot, but you're nice and dry. Another thing, if you're actually shooting, if you have to shoot in the rain, your best place is inside of a car. Because you can roll down the windows and you can stay nice and dry and you can move the car anywhere you want to. So it's sort of like a cover for you. And fuck the models. Who cares if they get soaking wet? I don't care. I'm just going to stay nice and dry. <laughs> that sounds so cruel, doesn't it? Um, to can you, uh, continue down here, this is a tricky one. So this is not a scrim. This is actually a net. What is he using this for? Because if you look at the light on her, you can tell that the light on her is still direct and hard. It has not been softened at all. Look at that edge light that's actually happening on her. What is a net doing in this? I have a spreading of the light. Anybody else? But controlling it in what way? Why on earth would you? Do you know how long that thing takes to set that thing up? Wouldn't it do what? No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't do any of those things. So this is one of the greatest tricks of all time because it's a way to keep directional light. But how many light sources do you see in this photograph? Or how many would you imagine? We don't see the sun, but we know where the sun is. You can see the direct reflection. You can see the shadow on him. So we've clearly got the sun as one light source. Are there any others? The ground, I have the ground and the car, any others? Well, the window behind her, that's going to be a tough one, because you're right, we see it, but that's, it, if anything, it would be like a backlight kind of thing on her, but any other light source in here? The sky, you're absolutely right. 
the primary light that's actually happening in here is this is the sun to begin with and then you have the sky and the ground those are really the three light sources that we've actually got in the sky right now if we did not have this guy on here what you would have that was hitting this girl primarily would be that direct light the direct light is really that's the it's the strongest of the players in here right and it's a very 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 contrasty light it's the light that you get at the end of the day extremely contrasty right so what they do with this black card is they use the black card. It still lets that direct light come through, but it knocks a stop of it off. Or you can actually get heavier ones. You can get, this is a one-stop net, but you can get heavier ones. You can get a two-stop net. You can get a three-stop net. Most of the people I know of work with a one-stop or a two-stop. So what happens is they knock a full stop off of the direct light, but it doesn't change the light of the sky or the ground at all. So you are reducing the direct light and you are raising this general fill light. You reduce the contrast. So what these nets do is they drop the contrast of your image. It keeps all the direction, but it lowers the contrast. Now again, in the digital world, something you can do in post, relatively easy, whatever, but um, anyway, just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant strategy. This one, I love this one because he actually sets up a twofer here. So this is the image that he's actually shooting. Again, another cover try for somebody. Um, and this is what he's done. He's thrown his, um, uh, you can see again where the light is coming from. It's coming from this back direction right here. He puts the silk directly behind the girl and it actually, the light actually fills the silk. So he's now got a white background. He also ends up with a hair light and an edge light on her for that. And then he turns around and he uses a giant reflector right here to become the foreground light to actually kick this back. He's got two pieces of gear that are actually doing this sort of lighting in the middle of the afternoon in a time where you probably shouldn't be shooting. And it's crazy. Right? And then I think, yeah, there's a couple more in here. This, we don't really care about. This is a classic, and it's one that a lot of people don't take advantage of and people should take advantage of, is he simply uses direct light. What's this called this time of day? It is, and when is golden hour happen? The hour before sunset, so basically the hour before the sun drops below the horizon, right? Is that true? Come on, all of you people who are like the captains of your, your, of your available light experience, the, you know, whatever, golden hour, right? Does golden hour happen in the morning? Yes, it's not only at sunset, it's at sunrise. Does it really happen up until sunset? Do you know? You're going to find out tonight. We're going to talk about this. So at any rate, this is golden hour. The sun is relatively low, and it's low enough in the sky to actually be an attractive light on her. Um, one of the problems that we run into is shooting available light is, is that available light so often is really overhead. And overhead light is not necessarily the most flattering light. That's the thing that we're going to try to deal with tonight in as many ways as we possibly can. Make sense? All right, so in this case, he's not using any modifiers at all. He's just using a long lens and taking advantage of it. The problem with this is, is that if you're shooting, again, when, does, uh, when do we get sunset in the middle of the summer here in Chicago? It'll stay, sun, you'll sunset will happen at 8.30, almost 9 o'clock. doesn't quite get to 9 o'clock, but it can get to 8, 8.30, something like that. So you've got to schedule your shoots for 7 o'clock at night. Oh, but wait. You're doing this, it's a really important job. You're gonna pay a whole lot of money for this. So wait, we need to shoot sunrise as well. When is sunrise? Oh, well that's four in the morning. So what do you do during your day? Well, you get up at two in the morning to start hair and makeup. Then you're ready and in place at four in the morning to get golden hour in the morning. Then you've got nine hours to kill in the middle of the day. So you go home and take a nap. And then you get up again and you go through hair and makeup again and you go through styling again and all that kind of shoot the hour at the end of the day. Um, yeah, long day. Um, what's going on here? What can you tell me about his setup? Yep, yeah, sure.
horribly overcast day. Look at the clouds in the sky, the stuff that's out there. There's no direct sunlight at all. So where is the light source in this image? What is the light source? Let's forget his modifiers. Just tell me the light source in the scene. The sky. And there is no sun. It is a giant, giant overhead light with not a whole lot of wrap because again the wrap ends up getting killed at the horizon line so there's not a lot going underneath her right so what ultimately ends up being the light that you get on this person right you guys have all shot this stuff it's fucking god awful it's this really heavy oppressively overhead light so you get all the bags that are underneath the eyes you get shadows that are down here that are completely ugly not pretty not flattering at all blah 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 so how does he compete with that so, the modifier on the ground, the silver foil, the silver guy on the ground, is a pretty obvious one. He's using that to balance out the light. So he's got this really heavy overhead light, he's got now something on the ground, and it's now balancing at least out. It's actually, um, some of it is, 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 the light's getting kicked back up again, right? So he's got a now a very top heavy light source and a bottom heavy light source. But what's up with the thing that's, that's what's up with the white thing that they're holding over the top of her? What's that all about? What it's doing, no, because the, 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 there's so many clouds in the sky, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed to get it any softer. What he's using it for, he doesn't want to subtract the light from overhead, but he wants to bring it down. So what's happening now here is there's light, again, the whole sky in front of her, behind her, everywhere around her is this same sky. So the light that's actually hitting this reflector that's bouncing on her is not coming from the back. It's actually coming from this side of him. It's hitting this and coming up and hitting her. She's got this really heavy overcast part on top of her. That overcast part is still going to be heavier than what she's getting reflected off this floor back up into her face. So they drop this over the top of her to not eliminate the overhead, but to knock it down. Again, he's using it to balance out. So that white overhead that he's holding is knocking a half a stop, three quarters of a stop off of the clouds that are above her to balance with what's going on underneath her. He can actually add to that. If that's not strong enough, he can actually add his um, uh, black silk on top of this to try to cut it down. He can take that thing and fold it in half, which will also cut it down. There's all sorts of tricks that people will use. But again, it's the same sort of lighting that you guys use in the studio all the time. You just need to actually use it outside. Make sense? Okay, and the last thing I'm going to show you here, and we're going to actually to try to get to that as well tonight. I would not suggest doing this myself. And yeah, does anybody see a problem with anything in this picture? A power pack on a sea stand in the water that he's standing in. So when the power pack goes down, he's going to be electrocuted for sure. I don't know about the people on the raft. They may survive that one. I'm not entirely sure, but he's dead for sure. No question about that. <clears throat> oh, the things we do to be famous. <clears throat> um, so if you were forced into this kind of situation, you might consider, you might consider doing something uh, 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 that would be more battery oriented but again a battery powered strobe will still put out more than enough power to kill you so um yeah i don't know what the real answer to this one is but there you go all right so anyway that's um stan melanowski sort of in a nutshell right there but again a lot of great tricks that we can look at really fast so now The one thing I definitely want to get through tonight. Um, so you guys are not, the assignment for this week would be actually get together in teams and do some of these lighting exercises outside. I've looked at the weather. Forget it. That's not going to happen. What I do need you guys to do, though, is to do sun charts and weather charts for me. And I'm going to show you what those guys are right now. This becomes a game changer, especially in, I'm, I'm going to say, in your own work. But this should also become a game changer in, in, in what you can do for a photographer, what you can do for another client. Um, I use these things all the time. I've built them all the time. So um, that's sort of where I want to start with right now. There's a really important document that is on our website that you guys need to download because it's got all the instructions and the links on how to do this. 
if you look in mine, it, my, um, mine is listed in week three. You'll be happy to know that this class, like so many of my classes, changes completely from the fall to the spring um, because we want to shoot early in the fall so that we're not shooting in the snow and we want to shoot late in the spring. So this is set up for the spring classes. So it's not going to be in week number three for you guys. It's going to be in week number 11 or 12. I'm pretty sure it's in week number 12. But anyway, the thing that you're looking for is this right here, this sun altitude and azimuth version 5. And if you... Well, that sure doesn't look like it, but I guess it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, what this is, is it's got a hyperlink that's sitting right in here that, again, and it will walk you through. So, for instance, it says start your browser right here and launch this guy. It should launch outside of a PDF as well. And it's going to actually take you to um, uh, a site that's actually uh, run by... Um, uh, they use it's the uh, um, uh, uh, basically the Navy is who's behind all of this uh, um, where they ultimately do all of this stuff. So um, this is looking slightly different than the last one that I've actually worked with here. So this guy actually knows. I think it knows where I am. Hang on. I clearly should have done this one because this is a completely new one and I forgot that I can have updated this guy. So let me, I tell you what, I'm going to do this because we're 15 minutes away from break. I'm going to hold off on this and I'm going to reset this and then I'm going to show you this when we come right back from break. So the other thing that I'm going to show you right now, which is the next thing that you need to know about, which is also listed in our website, is this right here. So if you take a look at this, this is actually an hourly weather forecast that happens at NOAA.gov. This is actually the U.S. government. Uh, and again, if you open this up, you can actually get to this link right here. I simply go to it when I'm in any browser. If you type in NOAA and say OK, it'll take you to the website. Up here in the top, uh, again, there's a whole lot of information you can get off the NOAA website, but what we're really looking for is this thing up here. So up here at the top, it actually gives you, um, because I've put this in before, it knows that I'm in Chicago. However, you can do this for anywhere in the United States. You can probably do this for anywhere in the world. You're going to click on Change Location. Somebody give me, uh, um, well, we'll do one for here, and then I'm going to do one for a completely different city. But I'm going to put in a zip code here for Columbia College, so 60605. And I'm going to go ahead and say go to this. And it'll say, okay, it's 46 degrees right now, whatever. It doesn't give you a whole lot of information, but you see this check, this box right down here that says see local forecast. If you click on the full local forecast, it opens up this window right here. And most of you guys are used to seeing this thing right here. I'm telling you right now, this thing right here doesn't do us one fucking bit of good. There's nothing about this. There's no information in here that's really helping me out. If you come down here, though, to this hourly weather forecast graph and you click on this, this is the money. This is what you're looking for. This is what you would want to do for a photographer for every single day that you have to shoot outside. And if you were not connected to Columbia College's shitty web server, you might actually get this in coming in in a timely fashion. When this thing opens up, it will open up for today. You don't necessarily have to keep it as today. You can actually change it. But it starts at the time where we are right now. So right now it's starting at 7 p.m. on a Monday for the time zone, for the uh, area code that we put in. You can actually um, say that you want to chart and that you want to graph all of these possible elements right here. You could add fog to this if you wanted to. You can undo things in here like right now. I don't think it's going to snow, but you don't know. So I, anyway, I would just leave all these things on here. Uh, however, if you come down and you look at this chart right now, this is everything for the next two days. And what becomes important to us is this. There's several things in here that are critical. 
Temperature becomes somewhat critical, but that's an easy thing. You can get that on your phone. It'll tell you what the temperature is going to be tomorrow. You'll know tomorrow is going to be in the mid-60s or what. I mean, that's not a really big one for me. I don't really care about that one too much. What we really care about is precipitation. That becomes a biggie. But the one that you care about that this graph does the best is sky cover. So if you look at this little blue line, so um, the top graph I've read up here is wind chill, dew point, and temperature. So you can see this is actually going through where you see these dark shadings. This is going to be tonight. So this is, well, Tuesday first thing in the morning. So early in the morning. That's what's going on here. This is sunrise tomorrow. So sunrise tomorrow, it's going to be 42 degrees, but our sky cover is going to be 37%. Can you shoot in that? What's your sky going to be like? You'll know, right? The sky is almost half clouds. Cloudy is basically what it's going to be, right? As you go through the entire day, it isn't going to change. And then in the entire night, it's not going to change either. The next one down that also becomes really critical, I'm sorry, sky covers here. I'm, I'm looking at wind chill up here. I forget wind chill up here. I'm looking at sky cover down here. It's this blue. So you can see it's, this is the legend right here. Sky cover, precipitation potential, and relative humidity. So you can see that right now there is 1% precipitation chance right now. We could go out and shoot right now. I wouldn't worry about that. It's not going to start to rain. When is it going to start to rain? When do I need to worry about rain? Six o'clock tomorrow morning, it's at up to 18%, but by seven o'clock, we're up to 50% chance, and then it just creeps up for the day. If you had to shoot pictures, so I've kidnapped your dog, I've got a gun to its head, I'm on FaceTime with you, and I say, if you don't shoot some pictures out shot, I'm going to shoot your fucking dog. When are you going to do your work? First thing in the morning or end of the day? Well, you can tell at the end of the day, it's going to be pouring down rain and suck, so I would... Six o'clock in the morning is when I'm going. Makes sense? So this has actually got two days forward. You can continue to go forward in your forecast. If you click the next two days forward, it will jump you ahead. And now you can see we're actually looking at the second part of the week. So we can see what manifest is actually going to be like. Manifest is going to be on Friday. This is what Friday is looking like right here. Sky cover for manifest is half of it's going to be cloudy uh, pretty much. There's not going to be much chance of rain. So at least we've got that going for us. It's going to be in the 50s. That's not going to be a whole lot of fun. And this is your wind gust. This is the last thing that you actually need and to check about and to care about. It's going to be relatively calm, which is a good thing for us. But if you're going to go out and fly a 20 by 20 foot silk, do you want to know that the wind is going to start gusting in the afternoon at 50 miles an hour, but the morning it's going to be completely calm? Yes, you do want to know that because then you can say to the photographer, we really should not be doing this in the afternoon. We should really be doing this in the morning because the wind is going to be killing us. So I want you guys to actually do one of these charts, and you can do it for other places. So for instance, somebody give me a zip code that's not in Illinois. Not, okay, hang on one second. <laughs> so I'm going back to, to Noah's uh, uh, initial uh, opening page. So uh, 95005, California. See local forecast. So again, go blow past all this stuff that you can get on like any weather channel and click on this. So now we see a slightly different story as far as that part goes. Um, the sky cover over at night is still going to really, really suck. But at the end of the day tomorrow, I've only got 10%. So I'm shooting golden hour tomorrow. Does that make sense? And I pick it right up off of this. I know exactly when I should be in place, ready to actually do this part. Um, not going to be, uh, I don't really need to worry about rain a lot. It is going to be a little bit windy, but not majorly. Seven miles an hour in the wind part, whatever. And there's no real gusting part happening. Uh, and it's going to be about 50 degrees, so I'll know to wear a sweater. Is this making sense to you guys, all of this part? You cannot believe how important this part becomes in planning out your day because we all know this. Days like, even like today, you know, it rained like shit. It was awful in the morning. It stayed awful as far as the light goes the entire day, but at least it was dry in the afternoon. If I had to be out doing something, I would have picked the afternoon to do it and I could have planned my day out that way. I wouldn't have been booking talent in the morning first thing, or if I had, I would actually be on the phone with the agent yesterday changing it and saying I really need to do this in the afternoon and this will just give you that helping hand you can really plot this thing out and these things are shockingly correct 
It's not 100%, but it's 85, 90. Are we good? Are there questions about this? Okay, um, guys, so let's call it 7.55. Uh, if you guys could be back at uh, 10 after, that'd be great. Um, and I, in that point, we'll figure out my new Sun Chart website. <clears throat> and can somebody do me a favor and turn on the lights if you're heading out?